Hello, everyone. Um, greetings from the Wonka Special Interest Group on Policy Advocacy. Uh, and welcome to our second webinar for this year. And uh, I hope uh, everyone is well. And we have a very uh, interesting discussion today. And we have our president-elect, Wonka president-elect with us, Viviana Madness Bianchi. Um, just to uh, tell you a bit about the webinar, um, today's webinar is about living a life of advocacy, an opportunity to learn from our president-elect. Uh, and uh, we have three panelists also from three regions. I think we will first uh, uh, try to uh, know who they are. Before that, let me uh, introduce my co-chair and the co-host today. Um, I'm, you, you know, I'm Sankarandani Kumara. I'm the co-chair of the uh, Special Interest Group on Policy Advocacy. And also I was the uh, uh, past Young Doctors Lead of Wonka. Uh, I have Amanda Howe, uh, uh, co-chair of the SIG. Uh, Amanda? Yes, thank you, Sanka. Uh, colleagues, you may know me. I was involved with many of the working parties, particularly the Women's Working Party. Then I was president of Wonka and on the executive for six years now, also co-chairing this with uh, Sanka. Thank you. Um, I will formally introduce Vivi in a minute, but let's go first. Um, Hina, to would you like to just introduce yourself? Hello, everybody, uh, and salam and namaste to those coming from the South Asian region. I can see a few names there. Thank you, folks, for joining. My name is Dr. Hina Javed. I work as an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine at Health Services Academy in Islamabad, Pakistan. Um, and I'm also um, chairing, uh, co chairing the party family medicine um, regional lead for South Asia and uh, working party on research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hina. Uh, we have uh, Marina from Spain uh, representing the Wonka Europe. Uh, Marina, introduce yourself. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Sanka. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Marina uh, Guisado. I'm a family physician and I had my PhD and I am honored to be here today as a panelist. I am currently serving as the secretary of the Wonka Europe Working Party on Policy Advocacy. That is a group that was formed in July of 2023. So it's a relatively uh, young group, but we are deeply committed to empowering policy advocacy and influencing European uh, policymakers to enhance primary health care. At this moment, we are working on a roadmap for policymakers to establish a high quality primary health care system across Europe. And we are working on it. Now I am based on Madrid and I am excited to be part of this webinar to learn from Dr. Viviana. And thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Marina. Uh, we have Mariano from Ibero America. Mariano is from Argentina. Buenos dias, Mariano. <laughs> Buenos dias. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mariano Granero. I'm a family doctor from Argentina. I live in Buenos Aires. And I coordinate in a space uh, of uh, community-oriented primary care here in, in the metropolitan area of Buenos Aires. And of course, it's a pleasure to be here with you all and just here to help. OK, um, I think uh, I, I just tell about uh, the structure of the webinar. We will be introducing our president-elect Viviana Matthias Bianchi in a few minutes, and Viviana will speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we have our three panelists who will be posing questions uh, to Viviana, and then we all can uh, uh, get together and we can discuss and we can pose questions to Viviana and our rest of our panelists. And uh, just to tell you about the, uh, the translated captions option, um, if you can see the bottom of the screen, we have a we have activated the translated captions option, um, where you have many languages, not only Spanish, Arabic, and Chinese, uh, many languages that is allowed by Zoom 
so you can can go there and uh, uh, activate that option so you can if you are not very very familiar with english you can always use this option and uh, see the captions or subtitles uh, from the language of uh, language which you which you like um and that's it and also i uh, to tell that uh, three of our speakers including our president elect uh are very very fluent in spanish so if you have any problems don't hesitate to ask the question even in spanish we are we are we are very much um happy about that today um amanda it's over to you to introduce viviana martinez bianchi the president elect of Honda. Thank you, Sanka. Uh, just one other thing on the captions. If you can't see it in the tool bar, then click more, then click captions, and then it gives you the choice for your speaking language and translation language. Anyway, um, Vivi, uh, I think Vivi is one of our most influential Wonka leaders. She's got a very long standing expertise in advocacy. And I remember when she was on my executive. She would help us by doing workshops for the executive to develop our own understanding of the competencies and the dimensions involved. I know also she has used this very effectively to advocate for the communities that she does her clinical work in, the underserved communities, striving for policies around health equity. So not just fighting for family medicine, but actually for the people. And she's been always passionate to share those skills. So this is an exciting time that she has agreed to join us and hopefully she will inform the work that we do in the policy advocacy groups, both at global and at regional level. So Vivi, thank you so much. Please uh, do your presentation and we look forward to it very much. Thank you so much for that introduction um, and for believing in my capacity for advocacy because it was, Amanda, when you were president and I was part of your executive, you believed in my um, ability to represent Wonka at the WHO and that in many ways um, changed my life and, and gave meaning to advocacy. But I'll share a little bit about me, uh, since some, some of you know me really well and closely and some have never met me before. I'll talk about what, what my values are, family medicine, advocacy, and health equity as personal values. It was my dad, a vascular surgeon, who instilled early on the idea of working with community and advocacy. I grew up in Argentina, uh, and we will often go sailing in the river. We grew up sailing. And my dad always carried his doctor's bag with him. And fishermen would often approach our sailboat. And as they approach the sailboat, el doctor, ahí está el doctor. Here's the doctor, here's the doctor coming into the island. And he will cure wounds, give advice. He will bring medications from the city into these more remote islands on the Paraná River. He will treat diabetes and hypertension. He will counsel against smoking. In 1978, when I was 14 years old, brimming with excitement, my father showed me newspaper headlines highlighting the Alma Ata Declaration. It identifying health as a human right and primary care as the key to the attainment of the goal of health for all. I was 14 and I said, when I was hearing this and when I saw his excitement and I, I, I said I wanted a career that would involve patient care, public health and global policy. And he said at that time that my specialty had not been invented yet. But I would that, but he thought that I would design my own path. Viviana, he said, this declaration can change the world. My dad was a very pragmatic surgeon who I think at times could be a naive dreamer. 
And at the same time, he always will say that solo está derrotado aquel que deja de soñar. Only one who stops dreaming is defeated. My dad guided me since I was a teenager on a path towards primary care, health equity and policy work. For me, family medicine has become that dream, the dream of my father, the dream of many of us, people before us and us. And family medicine is my vehicle for social justice. My dad unfortunately died too young to see me start residency training in family medicine. And when I finished my residency training, I was not aware that family medicine was starting in Argentina. So I moved to the United States to train in family medicine. I think my dad would be proud to see me in the path that I went through. And I also keep dreaming today that we as a collective can continue to make a difference towards achieving health equity in every corner of the world. Just like Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization has said that health is a political choice, we have the ability to, through advocacy, really, really, um, inform policy. And policy is not just what countries decide, but it's also what happens in our own environments, the policies and politics that rule the clinics that we work, the hospitals in which we work, the health systems, the public health departments. When we live in a world plagued with inequities, in a world where the circumstances are stacked up so differently for different members of our communities, what can we do to move towards a country continent, a world of justice, of equity, especially in equity and justice in health with access for all. And that has been a lot of my fight for family medicine. I had stood in front of this poster at the United Nations 11 years before starting to work with um, Wonka, reading this quote from the Declaration of Human Rights. And thinking how far we are from this declaration to be really our current reality. How many people around the world are not truly really free? How many are victimized and not considered equal to others in dignity and rights? We all know how much we need to continue to work for women around the world to break glass ceilings and to live in situations without violence home violence, work violence. We all want to work for all people should be treated equally, regardless of who they are or who they love. Advocacy for LGBTQ plus rights. Seeing inequities is my motor for advocacy. Family medicine is my form of advocacy individual and family advocacy, one person and one family at a time, advocacy for training family doctors who can solve both technical and clinical problems presented by their patients, advocating for increased funding to enhance family medicine's ability to deliver excellent care, We all know that by investing in mentoring programs, promoting continuity, continuing education and supporting young doctors, we can ensure a, long, a strong legacy of family medicine. I know that because Amanda invested in me when I was a younger than now family physician. I have done a lot of advocacy for Wonka's organizational equity so that all the regions are equally represented, that all the languages, everyone feels welcome to Wonka. Done national advocacy with issues relevant to family doctors in the American Academy of Family Physicians. Collective advocacy to, to the creation of a broad multi-sector partnership to alleviate suffering during the pandemic, especially for Latino Latin American patients living in the US, advocacy for better access to resources for historically marginalized families at the state level in North Carolina, where I practice, 
at the federal government invited to address the Bipartisan Committee on Education and Labor at a hearing on successful models for protecting communities from COVID-19. And most recently, as a member of President Biden's Council on Sports, Fitness and Nutrition. I was fortunate to be selected by Amanda Howe to be the Wonka W. Cho liaison from 2017 to 2018. And then Donald Lee asked me to continue on that role from 2019 to 21. Representing Wonka to the World Health Organization was a privilege to represent, just like what Pilar and Anna are doing at present time. Wonka as a non-state actor in official relations with WHO and comment on issues important to family doctors. And when I think is perhaps different for our own specialty is when, when we talk about family doctors, we're talking about the communities and the people that we see and serve. Representing Wonka at the United Nations, in Astana, when World Health leaders converged to Astana for the 40th anniversary of the declaration of Alba Ata. I couldn't stop remembering the day my father had shown me the Alma Ata Declaration, and now I got to be in Astana, the Global Conference on Primary Care, together with an amazing group of people that represented at the Global Conference. Family doctors, young doctor representatives, champions for family medicine in clinical practice, in research, in health policy, and in academia. All of us advocating for family medicine. Picture here in Astana, I'm asking whether there is true political will to make this new declaration happen. Will there be support for the training of family doctors to meet the world's needs, to support their teams? Will countries truly support primary health care, universal health coverage, and consider health as a human right? I envision a Wonka that elevates new voices and brings multiple perspectives together. I was very joyous when this new uh, SIG started. I envision a Wonka that transforms health globally by leveraging our role as a global leader. I hope that we all engage in advocacy. We must, we must work together as family doctors, as member organizations, as SIGs and working parties, as Wonka World Regions, as a united Wonka in intersectoral collaboration to make a difference. And my question to you is, what is your advocacy plan? Thank you. Thank you very much, Vivi. Um, I have some questions, but I'm going to let Sangha tell the panelists to ask the questions. So please go ahead. Yeah, we'll start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vivi, for that interesting presentation. I mean, uh, spreading throughout your life, actually living a life of advocacy. Um, yeah, we'll go to, first we'll go to uh, Mariano. Mariana, are you ready? Of course, I'm ready. Thank okay. you, Sanka. We, and what... th thank you, Viviana, for your presentation. It's a pleasure to hear you today. Um, I was just wondering when I was listening to you, it's like, how do we do when we come from different backgrounds here in Latin America, at least, uh, as you might know, um, we have different ideas of what the primary care means, of uh, what we should uh, how I don't know how to put it in English. Uh, ¿qué, qué es lo que deberíamos estar promoviendo? Uh, we don't prior, uh, we don't have the same priorities. So uh, how do we do when we don't have the agreements that we need before we start to walk a, a path of advocacy? Well, so. Uh, thank you, Mariano, for the question. I think if I'm going to repeat it back is. There are, we, we all live, you know, we, we, the world is diverse and the world is different in many different settings and we work in different settings, but there are commonalities. And one of the most important common ground is that we all strive to get people access 
to excellent, continuous, comprehensive family medicine or primary care. And it's not just, not just us doing the work, but it's our teams doing the work. And one of the most important issues of advocacy is for us to explain what is it that we do. That is not just about runny noses and little colds, but is that uh, we accompany people through very difficult times in their lives. And that our advocacy needs to be supported by data. We have to figure out how to, where there are no academic medical centers supporting family medicine insertion in the academic centers, we need the, because academia often, uh, those are, who are in academia are often the ones that can do the research that's necessary at the local level. When we live in countries that lie about data, that don't share, I have lived in the same country that you lived in, Mariano, where our officials will say that there was no malnutrition in Argentina when I was growing up, right? And you could see malnourished children walking the streets every day. So I think part of advocacy is pointing the realities and seeing you know, what is it that we're doing. And sometimes it's data. And sometimes if the data is not produced, we have to do the research to show what's happening. And also it's the stories that go together to the, with the data and explain what happens when families go to bed without having had access to food and nutrition and a doctor that can guide them on how to live in better ways, right? And, and that's just talking about the, the, the most difficult things. And then it, when it is with, with our health system and our settings, again, it's sometimes, unfortunately, it's a fight against other medical societies that don't understand family medicine or that feel that we as family doctors are trying to push them away. No, we're not. We're trying to help our patients coordinate their care. We don't need our patients to be seen 15 different neurofocus specialties. We need our patients to have somebody who can manage hypertension and diabetes without having to refer them constantly to neurofocus specialties do the work, and this is why training advocacy for appropriate training and support for that training, it's so essential. And to, so be able to, to really help families through. But Mariano, it's very complex, right? And this is why I think it's important, this core values project that Anna Stalva has started, the idea of what is it, what are our core values and what is it that we need to show to our policymakers. Thank you, Vivi. Thank you. Um, we will go to the next panelist and let's uh, discuss about this more after the after all three panelists uh, post their questions. We have Marina Galizado from Spain, uh, also um, uh, the secretary of the Wonka Europe Working Party on Policy Advocacy. Marina, you can ask your question from Maybe. Thank you, Shankan. Thank you, uh, Dr. Martinez, for your inspiring presentation, your words about uh, the past experiences and what your father shared with you and which you are now sharing with us are truly uh, touching. And um, I was thinking about your, your answer about Mariano's question. And we are trying to work uh, from Europe to visualize the role of primary healthcare. We've been working at the beginning with our role during the pandemic, but we are still working uh, to be on the first line in policymakers. So my question would be, what is the key message to convince politicians to invest in primary healthcare? I think one of the bigger issues that we see is that many politicians never had access to an excellent family doctor. They are not accustomed to being cared by, by really a, a family doctor. And because of that, they cannot articulate what we do into policies. In the US, the biggest change that I saw was that President Obama 
had a family doctor before in Illinois, before he accessed the White House. And because he had had excellent family medicine care for his own family, he was able to articulate a vision for primary health care in this country. Okay, and again, the U.S. has significant inequities, but the practice of family medicine is sound, right? And and it has access. It it, it has created a tremendous amount of access for people all along this country of 300 million people or more, right? So I think one of the issues is that. Another issue I think is is showing them what, what is it that we do every day. And how important is this for a community to have a family medicine center in the neighborhood? Marina, I have been very interested in the changes that have been happening in Spain and how I, when I visited Spain and I saw these really amazing uh, community centers that took care of the whole barrio. And at the same time, I also was horrified thinking about the volume of people that people needed to see five minutes per consultation. For such complex issues, oh my yes, goodness, <laughs> right? So, so again, are, is there a team that can take care of some of those answers? You know, a refill of medicine doesn't have to come to the doctor each time. It can be come to the nurse. So there's all these different models that, and this is why I think it's so important to, to have this, get into, get, to get together like this and share our own pearls of wisdom of how we can practice and how we can impact policies. Thank you for your answer. I've been taking notes <laughs> to create new strategies here in Europe. Thank you. And to be closer in primary health care with uh, politicians. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Vivi. Um, Hina. We have Hina. Hina is from Pakistan and she represents the, the Wonka South Asia region. Hina, go ahead. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And it was a great presentation, Viviana. Um, you mentioned core values, and I think core values is linked with equity. Now, my question is primarily focused at the South Asian region. You've been to the conference recently as well. How, what barriers do you see in the application of advocacy, particularly in a region where we do not have an equity committee um, and how do you see that transformation taking place and how would would you support it? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I am. Um, I think there's two things. There is organizational equity, the equitable representation of members of the organization, which is different from health equity, right? They are interlinked and there are often similarities in the root causes of inequities that are similar to both organizations and countries and health systems that cause similar things, right? Uh, who are the decision makers? Do they have a narrow focus or they have a focus of equity? Are they able to see through a lens of equity to see who is represented, who's not represented, who is accessing, who is not accessing? Um, during my trip in, in Sri Lanka for my the South Asia meeting, I, I, I talked about the, the people who live in the interstitial of society and in Sri Lanka, I saw the interstition is that there's those people who are very important to the economy of a country, but that are unseen and heard, the, the people don't really think about the value of their work. And tea workers, for me, were the representation of those people who are in that interstition, right? When I started looking at all these women working in the hills in central uh, Sri Lanka, and I thought, do they ever get a chance to go see a family doctor? Now, that's the other issue is that advocacy sometimes takes a, is dangerous in certain countries and certain police in and in certain political environments. And and having grown up in a dictatorship in Argentina, um, many many years before Mariano was born, I. I saw that, right? It's very hard to advocate, but I learned from my father and my mom both that I could do, they did advocacy through their medical, my mom is a biochemist, my dad is a, was a surgeon. They did advocacy through their medical organizations that we have an opportunity in our own 
member organizations to do the advocacy and say, hey, hello, are we paying attention? Are we paying attention to our salary only or are we paying attention to what's happening in healthcare in general in our societies? And so bringing this together and putting it together. And in, in regards to organizational equity, is it's saying what's obvious, right? And and I think again, it's that lens that allows you to see. It's like, oh my God, all the speakers are from only one region. All the speakers are from only one uh, gender. All the you know, paying attention and saying what's not, who is not represented here and why, and and create spaces where we are are safe to be able to say and notice. Now, Hina, I felt many for many years in, in the US even, I was like Viviana, like, oh, Viviana, you're always talking about Latinos and their act, lack of access to healthcare. So you become a bothersome person. You know, you, you end that, I call it the, the horsefly, the tabano in Spanish, the horsefly. But every now and then you actually see somebody who notices or somebody who validates that you're saying is true. In my case, it was my chair in my department who was a white male with lots of privilege who say, wait a second, pay attention to what Viviana is saying because what she's saying is true. And his validation helped me. So sometimes it's finding the mentor who, help, who can help us to advocate and say, hey, this is truly happening. Perhaps there is a, it's a moment of change in your region, Hina, and I hope that's true. Uh, is there a possibility for another question or a comment, Sanka? Briefly, okay. Hina, yes. Sure. Um, this is this is a comment, and it's um, for Pilar. I, I believe she's here. I know you 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 may be attending the WHA seventy seven. Actually, conference. Pilar has literally just left the meeting. She put in a chat that she had to go. All so... right. That's fine. If, if it's oh. personal, I would contact her afterwards. Um, it, it wasn't um, personal as such, but I just comment. Uh, there was a tweet from the Monica saying uh, we need to strengthen um, the uh, the primary health care in, in all the regions. And I was wondering um, if we mentioned, Viviana also mentioned trainings, uh, postgraduate trainings, particularly special emphasis needs to be given on the training of the family physicians and if can be it, if it can be kind of advocated from this policy group, that would be uh, excellent. Thank you. You know, I, I, if I may, because I've been seeing the work of WHO for 10 years or more and, and the United Nations, um, multiple declarations are done. The support we advocate for universal health coverage, for, for primary health care. And our politicians sign on agreements that often are not fund funded. You know, agreeing on something and treating on something is not the same as making it happen. But we have a responsibility as civil society and as organizations to say, hello, this is the treaty that was signed. This is what it says. What is the next step? And at the same time, be prepared to when you are asking about the next step, if they ask you, can you help? You say yes. But it is hard, it's difficult. It's it's being there, it's it's putting sometimes our head and our space in getting leaning into those spaces of difficulty. Uh, and yes, possibly addressing the barriers, the obvious barriers as well. Sure. Thank you, thank you, Hina. Thank you, Vivi. Um, I will now uh, hand over to Amanda. Amanda, you can start. Thank you. I already have one question that has been put into the chat. So please also, colleagues, feel free to put things there because with nearly 40 people, it's hard to see if you have the yellow hand. So I will invite you, but I'm going to just make a couple of comments if I may. Um, Vivi, one thing you said in your talk was about, you know, the evidence. And I think that one thing that Wonka can do, maybe through its individual active members, but I think briefings, giving people briefings, you know, what are the key arguments on one page or two pages for family medicine training, for integrated primary health teams? Because I think we know this. 
but to give people a short summary saves them a lot of time and they can translate, they can discuss it in their region, they can, uh, you know, decide who can use it where. But I do think that it's it's kind of a way that Wonka can feed things. And of course, colleagues for our SIG, you know, we will put resources onto the membership portal. If people find things useful, please share them there. And then other people can look back or you can send them to Sankara and me and we will post them in one area. So, but I think that's one thing. Another thing with Wonka, and it I think relates to what Hina was saying, is that it's really good if the executive, um, as it were, hold the regions a little bit to account about what they're doing um, advocacy-wise, but also to enable them. So I don't know, I'm not on the executive now, but to keep having this conversation, how is it going in your region? Do you need any other help? Um, you know, and doing, that's also what we've been doing in the Europe group and in global, trying to give you, our members, the competencies as well. And we're working on a sort of toolkit as a learning resource. So for training, for example, if you're doing postgraduate training or even in your own communities, you can say, okay, let's take the Wonka toolkit for advocacy and discuss it. And, you know, it won't be, you know, rocket science, but I think it, it's actually rolling this expertise out in an explicit way and helping people with the messages because in another way everybody is busy and if one could has a pack some packages that they can take and the regions are also accountable for making sure something is happening that that may be useful um so thank you now question the first one relates probably to what i've just said from Rick Botello saying, you know, is there any plan to have a sort of advocacy learning hub, advocacy and innovation hub? And I know Rick has some other ideas on that, but um, just maybe if there is other things that are planned, Vivi, you could comment and then I'm getting other questions. Thank you. Yeah, I think, well, you, you, Amanda, you know my love for advocacy and for training in advocacy. And there are advocacy tools that we should have available for people, the creation of an advocacy plan, the creation of a, a, I, I worked a lot or, or I participated a lot in Ever America doing these workshops many years ago on what is your elevator speech? Do you have your 20 seconds to explain what you do? Um, can you catch the attention of your Ministry of Health if you run into the elevator and you have 20 seconds and then you have two minutes and then you have a proposal written, ready to go, right? There, there's so many things that sometimes um, we don't realize that are so important, just as we know the management of people, we need the man to learn about the management of systems and health systems and how to do proper advocacy and creating really important um workshops for everybody in the system to be able to speak clearly about these things. Um, uh, as you know, Amanda, I just started my time in the executive again, and, and we, uh, uh, I personally believe very much in the possibilities of this uh, SIG in advocacy and in advocacy training. I think we have the opportunity to really work together to create workshops of ad for advocacy for each one, just like the Women's Working Party creates workforce for women to empower themselves. We need advocacy workshops at every one of the regional meetings to create empowerment for family medicine. Well, that's really good to hear. And again, there is perhaps a role without being too bureaucratic for Wonka centrally to mm -hmm. say for that because different regions conferences have different approaches to what is you know automatically billed or whatever but you know that is good um he actually had a comment as well about is there a current clearly defined policy that Wonka stands for um specialist postgraduate family medicine training and discourages non-training pathways into family medicine. And I must say, I thought 
there was, but maybe it needs, again, some updating and dissemination. And also, I know that many countries have, you know, need what I would call a transitional training program. So to okay. help those GPs who are not specialist trained to uplift, and not all countries, of course, are committed to this, but policy-wise, I think, Vivi? I, I, well, first of all, we are a member of member organizations, and each member organization supposedly is formed by those who have postgraduate training in family medicine. But in some regions, it happens a little bit differently. Um, there was a question about Cuba, and Cuba is one of the largest organizations in Iberoamerica America with many family physicians, but many of them are trained for to be family doctors during medical school and given the, the, the skill set. And then some then also do postgraduate family medicine. So there are still different models and each member organization has their own ways of doing. But I do think we have a tremendous opportunity because there's more than just family doctors working in primary health care. And we have the opportunity to say, wait a second, what is happening to those who are in primary health care already working in these teams providing clinical care and primary health care for communities all around the world that didn't get postgraduate medical education. Can we tool, can we skill those who didn't get that postgraduate medical education to elevate knowledge, to do continuous medical education, et cetera, and bring more people into the fold? I would love for us to not represent just half a million family doctors with postgraduate training, but actually more that are involved, more voices give us more power. And at the same time, we cannot do this without adequate training. So it's a complicated issue, Hina, in that many countries think that primary health care doesn't require all that extra training when we all know how complex this is. Another thing I just thought of, we did see some good examples. I actually was working with one um, of transitional training programs. And uh, maybe that is also something to ask in the regions and to share somewhere through the education working party, because they are, of course, tailored to each country if the country has committed to making that support for the existing GPs and working it through, but it might be a good thing to try to find good examples of that and to share them somewhere so that it I, gives models, again, for politicians also, if you can get the ear of politicians to say, well, this country has done this, you know, to help to support its GPs to be more like modern family physicians. So while we're doing the specialist training, you know, here's a yeah. model we could Group up. Yeah, and we've had co uh, continuous conversations about this. We're having this conversation in in the Pajo region, in Pan the Pan American Health Organization, um, on actually assessing the situation in the Americas at this point, right? Mm. Jacqueline Ponzo and others are 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 leading. We're working very closely with Pajo at the present time on something on on a on a research. To, to find out who are the family doctors in the region. Um, yeah. And again, you know, there are Cuba, Mexico, Brazil uh, have the largest, and then United States and Canada have the largest numbers of postgraduate trained family physicians. And at the same time, uh, some of the member organizations don't have so many members. What is it that, what can we do to bring people into the fold to increase their representation and increase the the power of policy making and of course also small can be beautiful so costa rica will not give many numbers but i think it has very good program um helena karapinen has uh, comments about also the importance of undergraduate education about primary care which of course is one of my um lifelong favorite topics helena would you like to speak to your question well thank you for this opportunity so uh, of course postgraduate education is extremely important 
advocacy and in, in enhancing that, uh, we might still forget sometimes that if we have very good GP education in undergraduate phases, then we might help help to avoid the prejudice that might be among other disciplines. And that might be one very important way to go further. And there is some evidence that that if, if we have good GP education in undergraduate phases, then then we may have more and better GPs later. Thank Helena, you for this I wonderful discussion. I completely agree with you. We we in the US we have family medicine interest groups in a family medicine interest conference every July that is attended by over a thousand medical students. And uh, even like it, I I practice in a very quaternary tertiary care university. I'm at Duke University and it was hard to generate interest in family medicine. And then Duke created this family, this primary care leadership track with students who came to the, the university to train in primary health care careers. With the, it was intentional. And that created a shift of interest from wanting to be cell a related bench scientists to say, wait a second, look at primary health care, you know? And so there's many ways and many uh, important things that can, should be done at the medical student and the medical school levels to really enhance the understanding of family medicine and to increase the interest in family medicine through rotating through family medicine, through participating in clerkships in family medicine as well. Again, it's difficult in a country that doesn't have many um, family medicine clinics to offer that opportunity to the undergraduates. But even if you only have a few, you maybe can bring people onto campus to give lecture or, you know, change agent or whatever. Um, so I think it's another one that we all, all our members need to be thinking what's happening in the medical schools. And who is advocating there? And in fact, in Ukraine, I remember when I first went there, the, the leading advocate was a diabetologist because he had seen what family doctors in the community could do to prevent diabetes early, treat it, manage it at home with the team. And he became convinced it was an important specialty. And he mentored Victoria and her colleagues into the first generation of family medicine there. So sometimes our advocates can also be another voice, certainly. Um, and Vivi, I think it's true to say that WHO has an agreement with the International Federation of Medical Students Association, who we also meet with when we go to WHO. And I remember they asked me several times to be a speaker at their pre-conference. And I think that link is important because many of those students didn't know about family medicine until I was talking. So uh, yeah. and, uh, that hard work at WHO, it's expensive. It can feel quite frustrating, but I think those relationships are very important that one could put in energy at that level. And indeed, you know, the WHO primer, the recent one, you know, it says so many things we've been campaigning for for years. So I think, you know, we have to keep doing that work as well. Um, other colleagues, is there anybody who would like to, sorry, oh, baby. Oh, Dennis raising the hand. Yeah. Austin yeah. is waving. Ah, yes, sorry, please, Austin. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt, but it was just going like flowing like a lot of uh, water. <laughs> and it, it, it is very interesting to see that uh, it could be just told in words in every dimension in our global village. Um, my question is, uh, can we just make some policy statements that could also connect with the institutional level or governmental level? Governmental is a question mark, not only uh, all, all the policymakers will that, do that so. But at least we can just uh, talk about advocacy for also undergraduates, because in some countries, uh, after they graduate without any traineeship, uh, 
family physicians could be work as general practitioners. So we may say that for the advocacy for all, can we just make the post statements and just make the people, the uh, healthcare workers, uh, policy um, makers, and also the ones who are just working in that field understand that uh, Wonka uh, is just uh, talking about it, thinking about it, and taking action about it. If you go to the website where there are the multiple policy statements for Wonka, you will see that we have spoken about this multiple times at the World Health Organization and the World Health Assembly and the Executive Board, and you, we could find the list. And if we don't have one, I think it's important to start thinking about what is it that we need to to say. Um, but I would, I would, I, I know I have talked about this. I have talked about the insertion of family medicine in in undergraduate education and in postgraduate education. There have been some multiple declarations at different times. Um, and so it will be important to start looking at what those advocacy statements and policy statements have been. And if we haven't made them clear enough and it's time to revisit them, I think that's the, our very, very next, very important next step. Just like uh, we've done other a very important political declarations for health and the planet, for example. Well, that, that's great. Maybe uh, if we make the institutions like higher educational councils of each national uh, partner, uh, do you think it will just make them to do the right way? Yeah. Vivi, <laughs> you can answer. <laughs> I thought that was a statement, not an end, not a question. Maybe it is. <laughs> my, I, I completely laugh. agree. I mean, I think <laughs> their the advocacy is it takes many, many different levels, and I think it's important to look at our own policy statements before, take a, t see, and then maybe re make them research. Right. Um, I think we have opportunities through our working parties and our SIGs about different, many different. And sometimes it takes the the you know we we are broad focus as family doctors. It takes a seek to say, hey, hello, we haven't talked about this. It's time to do this, right? Um, I, I think if we think about a policy statement in a way, is the great book that was just recently published by Wonka about the uh, undergraduate training, right? So so we have many different uh, tools that perhaps we need to say, okay, what does this mean? What, what do we mean by writing a book about this? Um, and, and translate those actions into policy statements. Great, thank you. Um, Sanka, nobody has put any other questions into the chat. I don't see any other hands up. I'm just checking, you know, and we make these seminars an hour and a half, but sometimes it's more long than people actually need or, you know, can afford. So also afterwards, you know, people can put things into the portal. We'll talk about that in a minute. But maybe if there is no other comment from our participants, then we oh, sorry, can there is a... hand, hand back for the summary. I maybe. just saw it. Sorry, there was a question that came directly to me. I think he intended to send it to everybody, but how yes. might we generate ethical human AI synergy mindsets to co-create ecosystemic network power to overcome the systemic prejudice against family medicine and heal our broken healthcare systems? So uh, uh, thank you, Eric Botello, for this, Rick Botello, sorry, for this question, because I think there is a, in many settings, there is a prejudice against family medicine, and we need to name it, and we need to respond to it in with power, with the power of knowledge, with the power of training, with the power of showing what is it that we do, and um, just like I mentioned earlier about politicians needing a family doctor for them to understand it. I also think I, and I think that our own narrow focus colleagues need to be our patients to understand what we do. 
uh, I know that my power in my own institution grew. My power is the, our collective power as family doctors because we are the the the, the medical home, the, the clinical home of chairs of other departments that are more narrow focus, right? That, that if I take care of the chair of orthopedics and I take care of the chair of cardiology and I take care, and these are my my patients and I provide excellent um, comprehensive care to them, then they understand more of what is it that we're doing. When we can answer questions to the man in the house, the woman in the house, the children, we can answer all these different questions. There's something that starts happening in their minds, right? And, and so, um, I just want to, I think it's so important for our own colleagues who also do advocacy to understand who we are. And then the other portion of our advocacy is funding. And there's very difficult, it's very difficult to do enough um, without enough funding. And we often as family doctors are part of that interstition of medicine that I was mentioning about the interstition of the society. Family doctors sometimes are also part of that interstitial, taking really good care of people, but not seen or heard or understood by health systems in the way they should. Thank you. Thank you, Vivi. Thank you very much. Uh, before uh, going to the final summary, I just want to uh, respond to what Hina has told about these non-training pathways and the transitional programs. And you have quoted Sri Lanka as well, so I can tell a bit about that because um, you know that what you have uh, told is that Sri Lanka has a very good public health system and the, the most of the um, infectious disease has been controlled, eliminated. So with that, um, when you take the primary care side, uh, we also have a very good uh, family doctor training programs, as you have told, uh, which are run by, the, by one of our member organizations, that is uh, College of General Practitioners of Sri Lanka and also by the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine. While having this, we also have some sort of uh, of um, uh, other programs coming in uh, with non-training pathways, as you have clearly told, uh, which are mainly uh, targeting at, uh, let's say, uh, qualifications. And probably I, 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 I agree that uh, they are undermining the importance of training pathways because sometimes they are uh, seem to be, I mean, the people who get these qualifications seem to be, and from the from the outward, I mean, for the society, just as the trained doctors, because they are, uh, I mean, I don't say that pretend, but uh, when you when when you are uh, when you have some qualification, uh, some post uh, nominal, you know, some uh, postscripts, so you people tend to think that they are trained family doctors. So I I, I totally agree with you that. Uh, we have to advocate more on uh, training pathways. And I also think that we have to uh, think of our own uh, uh, country-specific, unique programs, because uh, programs are, uh, I mean, the, 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 the necessities and the, the, the programs should be tailor-made for the, the, the necessities of the country rather than uh, planted from somewhere else. So I totally agree with you that uh, we have to advocate on having more training pathways, as well as uh, we have to uh, empower the member organizations to go ahead with their own pathways, which are tailor-made and which are which have been, which are developed in their own countries. So thanks for that. And uh, Vivi, I would like to invite you to summarize what we discussed today. I think there was a very good discussion about different topics, but over to you. Sorry, um, Shankar, that, Vivi, we have yes. one more hand up. Yes, sorry. I, yeah. say, I don't know if we really have time, but Rick, very briefly, it's okay. Very brief. Thank you, Vivian, for pointing out the question. I put the link in there. This morning, I used SUNY, which is a AI tool for writing songs. And I wrote a song about heal healthcare. And it's amazing what you can do on AI. And it's in the tune of acoustic progressive rap. So put your mind around that and have a listen to the song and see what you think. It was composed this morning and created. So let's use some AI 
human synergies to bring attention to the cause. Okay. And our next web for the SIG advocacy, of course, will be a choral webinar. How about that? <laughs> or, or a Greek chorus, or a Greek chorus, or whatever. Let's let let the metaphors roll. Thank you, Rick. I, I have I have reposted your um, link so people can have a look. Thank you, Rick. Well, yeah, let's have a competition about the best song and, and generate interest and in who can do it in their own languages and come up with things and use music as a conscious raising tool. So be inspired. Well, Thank that you. was my presidential tactic. If you remember, we always sang we are the champions of the world. <laughs> anyway, Vivi, seriously. Um, so so it, it's hard to generate one um, just simple answer to what happened this morning, but these are the things that I'm observing. A large group of people coming from different parts of the world, you know, these, sometimes these webinars don't generate, a lot of people are at work or it's late or it's too early or whatever is happening, yet we're all here. We are 32 people in person here paying attention chatting, sending information, and wanting to speak and wanting to listen. That we, what does this mean to me is that advocacy is important and that we all consider that it's important. There are issue advocacy, there are global advocacy, there are, and there's advocacy and everything in between. Um, we, I think we need skill sets, training, figuring out what works. Sanka you, men Sanka, you mentioned about what works in each region, Hina, you also talked about your own particular regions. I think that every region has issues of inequities. Every region has issues of advocacy that need to be done. In in, but there's a certain skill set about speaking clearly, about mentioning, about finding the ways. One thing that I have done. Sorry, this is different from from. I, I'm going to add one more thing that I wanted to say earlier. I've been a program director for 14 years at Duke Family Medicine Residency Training. And our residency program promised to train residents who would not just be excellent family doctors, but they would be advocates for their communities. And in that promise, we talked about how do you train to speak truth to power and not get fired as a result not get kicked out of your work as a result, because that is sometimes the risk of advocacy. But we all collectively can create really amazing training programs that will attract members of different generations and different countries to see how we can do this well. And so I thank you all for this advocacy, SIG, and I, th and I thank you all for being here today because we all can generate an impact, a significant impact globally um, with the ability to talk about how to advocate for family medicine and healthcare for all. Thank you very much, Vivi. We are so fortunate to have you today. Uh, and definitely a lot of people are here today, so because they, they really, really value your presence. Thank you very much. So the final comments uh, from, the, from our panelists uh, will cross the other side. Hina, you can start, then uh, Marina, and then Marianne. Um, hi, yeah. The last comment will be there's a, always a solution to the problem. So we, we need to be solution-oriented. Um, our transition period has, always been, has almost been endless. And I think it's time in order to produce competent doctors and safe doctors and increase the standard of healthcare. Let's focus on training. Let's make it the motto for the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, Vina. And uh, we'll be like improving daily. I mean, there won't be a solution, but again, we are improving from that point onwards. So it will be, there won't be, I mean, uh, ultimatum, but we'll be going to improve and develop our processes every day. Thanks. And Marina? Um, uh, you are, estás you are muda, muted. estás muda. Gracias. Thanks. Sorry. 
So I would like to thanks to all of you and also with Viviana's words that she talked about health as a human right, the importance of data and making primary healthcare visible that are very motivating for our group. Um, encouraging also family medicine residents uh, in advocacy and creative plans or workshops to address these barriers from practice to policy are crucial steps that we will work probably in the future. And I took some notes about what I have learned in this um, discussion. So thank you very much uh, for this invitation and for this participation. Thank you. Let's continue to work together then to strengthen primary health care and to visualize our work. Thank you, Marina. We all, all, always expect your continuous support. Mariana? Well, uh, it's, in, it's inspiring to be here. Uh, it's inspiring to be here sharing this uh, webinar with almost 40 people all around the world. Um, there are many ideas that just got into my head, and but there is something, Viviana, you said that uh, really got me. It's like when you said, when you point out uh, something that is going in a different way that should be going, when you point out uh, a problem and they, they tell you, are you going to help? You have to say yes. Otherwise, you are complaining. Otherwise, you are uh, one of those people that this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. I'm not going to do anything about this, but this is wrong, this is wrong. And that really got me. Um, <laughs> and I, I thought that it's simple, but it's also profound. It's also really deep. So uh, I'm taking this uh, with me. And I guess I'm going to say yes every time they ask me, <laughs> are you going to help? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It was so inspiring to be here. Thank you, Viviana. Bravo. Thank you, Mariano. Uh, I think don't don't forget that we all are with you, so you are not alone. Whenever you help, you need the help. There are a lot of people, your seniors <laughs> or colleagues, with you whenever we need some advocacy. Thanks very much, uh, you all. Uh, Amanda, a few thoughts finally. Yes, thank you. I, I actually echo what you just said for Mariano, because, of course, we are all calling, Mariano already said yes to being regional lead for our SIG in Ibero-America. Um, but we don't want him to then, you know, feel alone. We want to do that together and support. We are still looking for regional leads um, for Asia Pacific, I think, and maybe EMR. So if there are colleagues on the call who would consider, I know people feel, oh, I don't have enough experience, but actually you do. You are family physicians, you are interested in advocacy, and we can help each other. So I think the support from Wonka feeding what we need to do in our regions, in our groups, in our, um, you know, local areas, it's very important. And hopefully our SIG plays some part in that too. So thank you for the panelists and Sanka, please um, share the final thoughts from our group. Thank you, Amanda. Um, um, yeah, uh, I think we have to, uh... We, I, I'm going to share the plan that we have. So we are our, we were thinking of having a webinars in each quarter. So this is the second webinar. So we are successful in that, and we are already we have already planned the third webinar. And we I would say that we almost have we are all, almost having the the panelists as well. So probably in September, we are thinking of uh, having the next webinar by the uh, sick were sick. And also, we are thinking of having some regional webinars. Um, so we are thinking of starting it with from Ibero America. Uh, probably Mariano needs to work with us, and we will be supporting you uh, in uh, organizing this. And we also have uh, submitted a workshop for the Wonka Europe Conference in Dublin. So in September, we would like to see many of you in Dublin uh, with uh, in our uh, workshop, uh, more about the 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 
SIG's work, uh, we think we are thinking of a project, a few projects. Uh, one is the toolkit for policy advocacy. Uh, so we will share more about these things on our uh, Wonka portal, Wonka portals uh, SIG group. I have already uh, posted the link. If you want, if you are, uh, if you want to join the SIG, if you are not already there, I think most of you are there already. So we will be uh, informing you about our next steps on the portal and as emails. So thank you very much, colleagues, for joining. And thank you very much, Vivi. Thank you very much, Pina, Mariano, and Marina for joining us as panelists. So hope to see you soon again with another activity, the next webinar, and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have any feedback for us, put, you can put direct or on the portal because we want these things to go even better. But I think it's been great. So thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, everyone. everyone. Can I thank share you. this song? Can I share this song? Because it's actually really awesome. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's it's a, the surprise of the day, okay? Rise up, family docs, leaders, champions, change agents, mavens, super connectors, and peace and harmony, amplify our equity voices. Generating ethical human AI synergies, co-create ecosystemic network power, overcome systemic prejudices against our field. Family docs advocate for fair rules, fair game, fair play. Fair opportunities, fair rewards for all Cultivate equity, meta-governance Be fair and kind to all People, planet, nature, animals, plants and soil on a regenerating healthy planet Rising tides, the peaks of unfairness Economic, social, educational and health inequities Will disrupt with the seismic shift of equity Zooming out from reductionist, elite partialism Embrace generalist complexity thinking We all serve, we the people Family dogs advocate for Fair rules, fair game, fair play Fair opportunities, fair rewards for all Cultivate equity, meta-governance Be fair and kind to all People, planet, nature Animals, plants, and soil On a regenerating healthy planet Our voices muted by oppressions now Moral hubris, cultural hegemony, and will dispel Cultivate the ecology of family medicine where care dwells Family doctors flowing with people On tumultuous life journeys, high and low Family doctors have powerful stories to tell Family docs advocate for fair rules, fair game, fair play Fair opportunities, fair rewards for all Cultivate equity, meta governance, be fair and kind to all People, planet, nature, animals, plants and soil On a regenerating healthy planet